So what I would like to talk about is studying history at the University of Reading. And I snuck in there, as you can see in brackets, African history, because that's what I feel really passionate about. I'm a historian of Africa. So what I would like to do, if you can show the next slide, is first talk to you and with you about African history, how it is taught at the University of Reading, and then more broadly, secondly, on what we offer, say a few words about careers, and then round it off. And I'll try to do this in the assigned time. So what I first of all would like to do is give you a taste of what it is like to study history, and in particular, African history. So if you can show the next slide, please. This is how I begin one of my modules. I always take my students to Africa, as you can see. Can you actually see my cursor on screen? No. No, just mine, unfortunately. Yeah, of course, yeah. Just making sure here. So you see South Africa at the very southern tip of Africa. And then if you just, uh, this is a animated slide. If you just use the uh, cursor, um, then you see the city of Pretoria. So that's specifically where I'm going to take you. One of the misconceptions about history is that it ended a long time ago. What we do and what makes us distinct in the UK is that we actually teach history up to the present. Any of you who followed the news in the last 10 days will have seen horrific images on TV or uh, on the internet um, of um, looting and pillaging in that particular part of South Africa, in the northeastern part of South Africa, where men and women and even children have gone to the shops, have gone to shopping centers and looted. What I do in this module is explain the path to that. What are the deep rooted frustrations that South Africans feel today? What is the origin of that? And in this case, I'm going to take you back to the mid 20th century. If you can show the next slide, please. Oh, there's one in between. Isn't there? There should be one in between. It shows on the left hand side. This is really odd. Um, I don't know if these are the other slides that you sent that maybe have slightly less slides. Ah, OK, that's OK. <laughs> it, it's OK. So I'm going to take you to the city of Pretoria. Um, there was another slide and you can get those uh, as a PDF if you want to, if you want to look at these images, a very intimidating 19th century courthouse, um, a courtroom with a very formal setup as courtrooms tend to be, and eight African men were tried for what was called at the time sabotage. Now, some of you, I don't know, may live in London or other parts of the UK where you may have hopefully not personally experienced, but where you may have encountered close to where you live, terrorist attacks. We've had bomb attacks, the um, uh, India RE concert, we've had attacks in London. And from the government perspective in South Africa in this trial in 1964, this is what these eight African men were tried for. They called it sabotage, but it was considered to be terrorism, acts of violence and organizing violence that was carried out against the government and against the civilian population. So the South African, in South Africa, the legal system is different from the British legal system. And when the defense is allowed to make its case, so the defense of those who are accused, um, the, it's usually the lawyer who makes an opening statement where the lawyer explains why the defendants, those who are accused of a crime, are either innocent or should receive the lowest possible sentence. In this case, one of the eight ex accused African men was a lawyer. He had studied at the university, very unusual. He was uh, one of the very, very, very few African men who had gained this particular very high status of education, a formal academic education. And he decided with the others that he would speak. And he used this opportunity to speak for a very long time. In fact, and I suggest you don't do it right now. If you Google this, um, uh, then you can find that the National Archives in South Africa have now provided the transcript of the statement online. And you can read the written version of what was said. 
right at the beginning, a minute in what this defendant said, I must deal immediately and at some length with the question of violence. Some of the things so far told to the court are true and some are untrue. I do not, however, deny that I planned sabotage. I did not plan it in the spirit of recklessness, nor because I have any love of violence. I planned it as a result of a calm and sober assessment of the political situation that had arisen after many years of tyranny, exploitation and oppression of my people by the whites. Why do I open my module on African history with this statement from the doc, this defense statement? It's extraordinary in so many ways. And I think especially today, it's a really important reminder of struggles in the past. Here the defendant says, well, let's address it right away. We are accused of having carried out sabotage, of being terrorists. Well, and he says, I planned sabotage. So this is my emphasis on the text. So he's pleading guilty. What was the sentence for having for being found guilty? The minimum sentence was life imprisonment. More likely was the death penalty. So for him, at the beginning of the defense to say, yes, I did it, is extraordinarily courageous. Think about it. He's standing there, and as his defense, he says, yes, I did it. And then he used more than an hour, and the courtroom was full of white people. The judge was white. The assessors were white. There was some press that the journalists were white. Everybody around him was representing the white government. And he continued then for a long time to indict the government, which means to say, well, there are reasons why I planned sabotage. He never took up weapons himself, but he planned it. And he says, I did not plan it in a spirit of recklessness, nor because I have love of violence. I planned it as a result of a calm and sober assessment. So this view of, oh, African men are, or more broadly, uh, black men are um, prone to violence. You can't trust them. They are wild. No, he says, no. There was a calm and sober assessment. And the result of that assessment, he says, is the political situation that had arisen after many years of tyranny, exploitation and oppression of my people by the whites. In other words, he starts the defense statement by saying, I'm guilty, I did it, but I did it not because I'm some crazed black man, I did it because you practice white supremacy. Can I have the next? No, actually, let's leave it there. Um, and now I should have forewarned you. Do you have any idea who this is, who made this statement? And you can either type in the text box or speak up, unmute yourself if you want to. Any guesses out there? Trained lawyer, 1964, South African. Nelson Mandela, perhaps. Excellent. Yes. Why do, why do you think it might have been Nelson Mandela? Well, I looked at the date and I thought, well, 1964 in America, it would have probably been Martin Luther King, but over in South Africa, it would have been Nelson Mandela at this point. Excellent. Yes. He's so famous. He became so famous with it. And he did, in fact, and the other defendants were all found guilty and they were all sentenced to life in prison. And it is quite well known that Nelson Mandela then served almost 30 years, a lot longer than you have lived. And even though I'm, as you can see from my white hair, I'm not young, but it's a good chunk of my life as well. Um, so yes, it was Nelson Mandela. And we don't think of him today in those, uh, um, in, in, in this way at all. Um, and what we think of him as a peace icon, um, and I want to get to this now, if you can move it to the next slide, please. Yeah, so I added Nelson Mandela's statement from the doc. This is how it became known. He ended his statement by saying, I fought against white domination and I fought against black domination. 
I've cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve, but if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. So he ends on a similarly tremendously strong note of saying, yes, I know in all likelihood we'll get the death penalty. So I, yes, I, I, know, I knew and I know what I'm doing. I am prepared to die for this. But most importantly, I argue and discuss with my students, which right now we don't have this opportunity, but if you come on campus for an open day, if COVID allows us to, we can do that. Or if you join us in the history department, is to discuss that what do you think about my argument that was most important is that he says he's in favor of a free, a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony. In fact, leading up to this trial, he stood shoulder to shoulder with the Indian National Congress. Some of his closest allies, while he, before he was imprisoned, were people who identified as South Asian people from India or whose parents or grandparents came from India and who also fought for equality and took the same risks with him and with other African men and women who took these risks. And increasingly, certainly after his imprisonment more so, there were many, 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 not in the sense of a majority, but many, many white South Africans who stood shoulder to shoulder, risked their lives were killed, were attacked by the South African regime as well. So Mandela very much stood for freedom for all, not just for black South Africans. South Africa is only free if there is true equality. And whoever is opposed to freedom needs to be fought. So he says, fought against white domination and I've fought against black domination. Can you move to the next slide, please? Oh, sorry, it's, yeah. Uh, so this is how we remember, how we look at him today. Sorry, yeah. Um, 1990, Mandela being released from prison with his then wife, Winnie Mandela, no pun intended, he was married a few times, walking out of prison, their fists raised, the fight goes on because South Africa only gained majority rule, full democracy, voting rights for all Africans. Uh, in 1994. So 1990, it was still the fist raised. The fight must go on, walking proud out of prison as he is released. And then I love that photograph on the bottom right with his uh, final wife. Sorry, I know it sounds funny to put it that way. Well, to me at least, with Gracia Machel. Um, and I like it because, you know, we see two old people who really found each other and um, had some happy final years, uh, his final years, Gracia Marcel is still alive. And then to the left, we see the young, younger Mandela with Winnie, uh, with one of the young children who grew up without a father as Nas Mandela was imprisoned for almost 30 years. So if we can move on now, please. After his release from prison, and then in 1994, we have the first democratic elections. Nelson Mandela very quickly became the most famous African. And this is a cartoon by the South African cartoonist Zapiro. I sometimes use political cartoons in class. Zapiro is very widely known in Africa, in particular in South Africa. And this was on the occasion of the state visit by Nelson Mandela in 1996. Uh, when he had been president for two years. So that's a bit of an unlikely career, almost 30 years in prison and then president of a country. Um, he was the first, and to my knowledge, the still only person on an official state visit meeting the queen, not wearing men, I should say, not wearing a suit. Uh, he had by then um, said, I'm, I'm done with wearing suits. And he always wore these very colored shirts and patterned shirts. So it wasn't even a white shirt and very tongue in cheek from a South African perspective. You see one Bobby saying to the other, ne the next expletive tourist who asks who the little old lady with Mandela. And the sentence breaks off. So, yes, Mandela at that point, the single and to still today, single most famous African and certainly at the time more famous than the Queen herself. Um, something celebrated in South Africa 
and around the world. Um, so if we can move on, please. Uh, actually, this is an old version of my <laughs> slides, so one more. Yeah, I just very quickly just want to say two or three sentences about apartheid. So full segregation, it had existed since the presence. Um, so racial discrimination existed in what became South Africa since the presence of whites there, which dates back to 1652. But the full system of segregation that people like Mandela fought against was implemented in 1948. And then, as I already said, ended in 1994. And apartheid in the Afrikaans language, one of the South African languages, means being apart segregation. And if you, it's an animated slide, if you just click it again, please, then you see, oh, I have a thunderstorm here. Sorry, I have to close the window, comfort my cat, and keep talking. What apartheid did was legally create uh, four different races. So the entire population of South Africa was assigned in their passports to belong to one of four races. And depending what race you belong to, you had different rights within South Africa, rights to education, rights to travel, rights to jobs, right to where you were allowed to live. And in this hierarchy of races that were created, if you were considered to be African, you had the least rights. And in fact, when it was fully implemented, then you had to carry a passport in your own country. Now think about this, a passport to be allowed to live and move in your own country. Sorry, the camera moved, that was my cat, he's scared of the thunderstorm. Um, and if you move the slide to the next slide, please. A horrific system. Um, yes, you can just animate the four images. Everything was segregated. Hospitals were segregated, drinking fountains, and one of the most bizarre things in my eyes, even beaches were segregated. And when segregation sounds bad enough, but I would like to emphasize two things. One is it was formally introduced in 1948, after the never again, when the world said, after the experience of the Holocaust, after the experience of World War II, we had done with all of this. We have to have one humanity. And clearly, South Africa moved exactly the other way. It took the United States. Uh, I think it was Samuel or Sam uh, who mentioned uh, uh, Martin, Martin Luther King. And yeah, as the United States was at the height of the civil rights movement in 1964, finally had the Civil Rights Act. Things are bad enough still today, but at least it moved in that direction. South Africa moved the other way. So it wasn't just segregation. It meant, you know, if, if hospitals were segregated, it also meant that hospitals for African men, women, and children were significantly worse than those for those who were considered to be colored or Asian or white. Can you move on to the next slide, please? So I just want to spend a minute and not more than that, and I'm happy to answer questions if you're interested in it, um, on one particular incident of resisting apartheid rule. So I'm just, you know, I am a historian after all. So you see a chronology here, apartheid rule beginning 1948, ending 1994, with a free and fair democratic elections. Mandela becomes president. And somewhere in the middle there, we see the 1976 Soweto uprising. If you move to the next slide, please. And it was an uprising of school children. Um, I don't know how clear that is on the photographs. I'll show you another one in a minute. A lot of the children in their school uniforms went to the streets of Soweto. Soweto means is the short form for Southwest Township, an urban area, area reserved for African occupation only. And the children took to the streets because more of their educational rights were taken away from them. And they said, no, we deserve an education. You can't take more away from us because then we can't get jobs and we are even more disenfranchised in our own country. The children were unarmed and it's an animated slide if you just uh, 
click that once, please, Louise, then you see the top left, um, that banner that the children are holding up says, don't shoot, we are not fighting. And that needs, leads to the next slide where you see quite young schoolgirls in their school uniform forms rounded up by police. Now the next slide is animated and we'll see how that works. Um, Louise has done a great job with that. There is going to be an image that is really disturbing. You don't have to look at that at all. Um, so do look away until I tell you it's gone. It's not there yet. Um, this is not, the purpose is not to, you know, make you miserable. So 15,000 school children went to the, took to the streets for a few days in this one urban area and protested and said, we have a right to education. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine fighting, risking everything? And what they were facing very quickly was the white government deploying the police. And not just with this sticks and whips, but they were armed. And so if you click it again, please, Louise, then you see the result. 23, th uh, sorry, 23 children officially by government. The government acknowledged that 23 children were killed. But the estimates that up to 700 children were killed in those protests and up to 1,000 injured. And what you see on the left-hand side is a photograph that was taken by an African photographer who documented, who took the risk, risked his life to take photographs of the school children's protests. And you see a boy who found the sister and brother, the 12-year-old schoolboy in his school uniform with his sister in school uniform, shot to death by the police. And the sister just, traumatized, screaming, crying, and this other boy picking the boy up, cradling him and carrying him home to the parents. A very disturbing image, and that's one of the reasons I chose the stamp, uh, which the South African government, once free, uh, created on the occasion of the 25th anniversary. So if we move on, and I realize I'm getting towards the end of time. so. This module I'm teaching is a third year module where we spend five weeks on South Africa and five weeks on Zimbabwe. We talk about African lives under white minority rule. We talk about African lives fighting for liberation and then also living the legacy. So I come back to this misconception that necessarily history ends a long time ago. No, we look at it up to today. So if I were to teach this in autumn, I would definitely, you know, bring in the, the looting we've just seen in South Africa and still seeing today, um, and then connect that to these historic events. I talk about all the different, you know, four races were created. So we have four different sets of experiences and then break it down further from there. I use different kinds of sources, written sources, but you see Yuma Sekela and Miriam Makeba who performed a song Yuma Sekela wrote for her about the Soweto uprisings, about the children and the parents crying for the children who were harmed and killed. I teach South African history through the Springboks, their uh, victory in the 1995 uh, Rugby World Cup and how they are uh, presented in South Africa in TV commercials, uh, in a way, in advertisements, in a way that represents how the nation is formed after the end of apartheid rule. In poetry, Chirikure Chirikure, a Zimbabwean poet uh, who writes about what it means to be Zimbabwean. So a broad range of different sources, which make, in my view, history uh, exciting. And I like to think that's shared by my students. So if you can move on, please. So the last slide on African history, and then I'll talk quickly more broadly about the department. You can take modules in every year if you want to um, on a broad range of issues. I teach mostly modern history and the gender in Africa a module. I also teach pre-colonial history. Um, in the second year, um, we visit a different um, country every week. So you get a broad view. 
um, we go in depth in some other modules, um, a lot you can take out of that if you're interested in that. And the same is true, of course, for my colleagues who teach other areas, which leads me to the broader view. If you can move on, please. So what do we offer? I'm not going to go through all of this in great detail. What I would like to emphasize are a few things. First of all, we teach Western history, including Black British history, which is very popular among our undergraduate students. We also, in addition to Western history, and I've been singing my own song here because I feel strong about it, African history, but we also teach Asian history, in particular, South Asian history, so Indian history, um, and you know, as it was broken up into Pakistan and Bangladesh, uh, we teach Middle East, we teach Africa. Something that makes us quite unique in Britain is that you can take courses from medieval times to the present. Um, we offer, and you are asked to do a research uh, paper and a research essay in your first year already, where you can choose any topic you're interested in. Two years ago, I had a student who actually wrote his first year paper and his third year dissertation. I had no idea that his parents were from Bosnia and he wanted to write about the Bosnian genocide of the 1990s that his grandparents and parents experienced. He was British born. And it was only after he submitted his dissertation, he told me, yeah, that was actually his family background. And he wanted to explore that through his own research and we support that. Um, we support in your research anything you want to do, which is a wonderful opportunity for you to be excited about it. All, you know, of course, it's research led. We have a very high satisfaction score among our students. And I think part of that very much is that I like to think, like myself, my colleagues like to get to know their students. Um, you know, I like to get to know you. And it's really weird to, to talk to you while your cameras are off. but. You know, that's very much part of it. We have a broad range of approaches. You can do gender history, history of sexuality, social history, political history, cultural history, religious history. You know, we do uh, history of Judaism, Christianity, Islam. We can't cover everything, but we certainly do a lot. And that leads me to the next slide. Uh, and just mentioning this, I'm sorry to rush through it, but we also offer a broad range of joint degrees. A lot of our students enjoy that. And then as you get to your third year, you decide where you want to do your dissertation, whether you want to do it in history or in the other, in the other degree, um, in the other program. Um, and quite a few students then choose us because uh, it's, it's a lot of fun to do it with us because it's really your project. You have a lot of choice uh, to do it, uh, what topic you do it on. And so, um, yeah, that's all I'm going to say about this. Um, so if you can move on, please, Louise, and I'm coming to the end here. Yes, careers. I'm getting to the last two slides. Um, you get a lot of support with careers. Uh, we have career services, universities tend to have that, but we have this inbuilt into our modules. So a lot of opportunities from the very first term you are a history student at the University of Reading. It's transferable skills, we practice with you in our modules, but then also through placements, internships. My po uh, colleague from the politics department mentioned examples from politics. I could give you some with us. Um, a colleague who's in the room with us, uh, Jackie Turner takes students to parliament. She is very involved working with parliament. Um, we take students abroad uh, once COVID allows that again. Um, we have placement opportunities and again, quite unique. Something we offer is the third point you see there, the opportunity to do your research for a research project that one of the colleagues develops and you can then apply to do the research during the summer. If you can move on, please, Louise. So job su successes, I'd actually change this. This is a slightly older version, but the world is yours with history. 
um, as an Africanist, I like to give the example of African presidents who had a BA in history, such as Julius Nyerere of Tanzania, um, such as he wasn't president, but he ran for presidency, Azikiwe of Nigeria, and I can name more. But um, among our students, uh, so students who graduated with a BA in history, as a historian, you can go into uh, national heritage, museums, um, archives, libraries. A lot of our students want to become teachers. We have civil service fast track uh, uh, that you can enter as a history graduate. One of my students who wrote her dissertation with me on Kenya loves it to be a cosmetic product distri distribution manager and she lives the life in London. Um, and I really want to mention, I realized that only a few of our students actually choose to become an academic. But last week, one of my PhD students who I've taught since she was an undergraduate signed a contract, first job interview, immediately got a job offer. And from next month, she's going to be a lecturer uh, teaching African history. Um, so the world really is yours. And the student who did his dissertation on the Bosnian genocide joined the police. So I think this is got to coming to the last slide now. Yes, feel free to contact us. This is again a cartoon from the South African cartoonist. So what would you like to be employed? Yeah, history degree does really well in placing you for anything you may be interested in afterwards. So feel encouraged, please. <laughs>